Hey guys, this is Dr. Calkins. We are now in week three, chapter four. And week three, chapter four is all about the electrons. And in order to understand an electron, we need to make sure we understand at least the theory behind how we discover where they actually sit around the nucleus. So in order to do that, we need to understand light. And we're gonna have a experiment coming up using light uh, to help demonstrate what we're about to show you. But what's most important is in order to understand light, you have to realize that it basically has two forms. You have a photon of light, not a proton, just a speck of light, and it also moves in a wave. That wave determines how dangerous that particular light happens to be. Light is just a form of radiation. And all radiation is determined by what kind of wave size and length of that wave can determine its um, energy and its danger in the end. So as we look at things in light, just remember that as we think about this wave pattern, it's kind of like what we see when we look down the highway in the summer. You see that little curly line of that you know heat wave idea. But as we measure from valley to valley in our little waves or even peak to peak, this is what would be considered a wavelength. And different wavelengths produce different colors. Uh, longer wavelengths can be things like red, shorter wavelengths, things like purple, and so forth. And another thing that we usually associate light with is the uh, rainbow. So in our class, what did you learn about colors of the rainbow? Well, hopefully you're thinking in your vast knowledge of color that Roy G. Biv is a great interpretation of the colors of the rainbow. So we're gonna write Roy G. Biv backwards. And this is what we would call visible light. This is gonna go anywhere from about 750 nanometers up to about 380 nanometers. And that's what our eyes are capable of seeing. Not everybody can see all these colors. Some people are colorblind or color deaf. It just depends on how your eyes can absorb that radiation. But what I would like to do is show you how you can think about the entire electromagnetic spectrum just based on things that you've experienced in your life. So when you think of violet, so again, Roy, uh, Roy G. Bibb is red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and they go with violet. When you think of violet, also think of ultraviolet. So UV, notice the V's are next to each other, UV ultraviolet is dangerous. We know that because we can get sunburns uh, being outside too long from the sun. So that tells us that in this direction of Roy G. Big backwards, danger is going towards violet. So it's almost like purple is the most dangerous color, theoretically speaking. And that's because it has the shortest wavelength. So if energy and danger are related, then that means wavelength goes in the opposite direction and things with long waves tend to be less dangerous. So as we look at UV, we have to think, well, that takes sunscreen, so maybe some zinc oxide put on your skin, nice bright and white titanium oxide, absorb some of that radiation so it can get to your skin. But if we move over, What's more dangerous than something that we've dealt with in life than ultraviolet rays from the sun? Something that requires a lead vest would be an x-ray. X-rays are more dangerous because they have more energy. They have a shorter wavelength. So as we're seeing this electromagnetic spectrum come to its uh, conclusion over on this dangerous side, what we're seeing is these waves are gonna be very close together and as we get longer, they start to stretch out. And as they stretch out further and further and further, they become less dangerous. So how many waves you get per second, that's called frequency. So a higher frequency is higher energy, that's more dangerous. And that's why x-rays can be more dangerous. The only thing more dangerous than an x-ray is a gamma ray. So gamma looks like that diving fish letter in the Greek alphabet. And gamma rays are used in cancer treatment, also used to make things like the Incredible Hulk. Um, so you hear about those quite a bit also with nuclear weapons. 
The only thing more dangerous than a gamma ray is a cosmic ray, and unless you take a trip to the sun, you don't have to worry about those. So cosmic ray, definitely the worst of the worst. Solar flares, that kind of idea. As we go on the op opposite end, we're gonna see that red is next to infrared, or what we call IR. Just a fancy name for heat. Lots of movies that use heat-seeking missiles or uh, you know, heat binoculars from the Army, that kind of thing. Uh, predator movies that have you know, heat vision kind of idea. Uh, but this is, again, infrared. But notice red next to red makes sense. As you go less dangerous, yeah, this one's probably the biggest and most misplaced of all. This is a microwave. And the reason that it's in this position is because these guys here, in those nanometer kind of ranges, something that is larger than a nanometer on the metric scale is a micrometer. Micrometers are the sizes of things like bacteria and viruses. So you take microbiology classes for that. And that's just based on the size of our wavelength. So microwaves very hard to think about because when you put popcorn, it looks pretty dangerous to those kernels. Uh, when I was a child, I put a hot dog in a microwave for 20 minutes. Turns out that extra zero makes a big difference. So microwaves are only dangerous because that machine is designed to put all that radiation in that one single spot. And um, But if you look at the microwave, it's not gonna hurt you. Just like if you look at heat down a highway, it's not gonna hurt you. This next one is the one that your parents do not want me to show. This is where cell phones, TV, and radio form. They're the longest waves, they're the least dangerous. So when you hear things on the internet like, uh, Using your cell phone too much is gonna give you ear cancer. Now you know it's not true. The least dangerous kind of radiation, just like radios, just like TVs. The reason that your parents tell you that you're gonna get ear cancer um, from radio, TV, and cell phone waves is because they want you to go outside and have fun and not be on your phone. So this is a great way to think about radiation as we move forward into atoms because electrons can release light when they're excited. So something that we're gonna notice very quickly and very soon, and this will join us into another lecture pretty quickly, is if you have a proton inside of an atom like hydrogen, you have an electron on the outside. So here's hydrogen's proton, here's its electron, and it floats around in this little stadium kind of concept, so Marble Bush Stadium idea. But if we add energy or electricity, we can add this energy to the electron, and it's going to jump. So where it's currently located is called the ground state. But where it jumps to is probably some empty layer of our atom. And when it lands, that's called its excited state. An excited state is something that we can't see. Just like giving the classroom full of students a taser when we zap them, they would jump. Just like electrons are jumping here. They would jump out of their little chair. But what's unique about that process is if we can't see it jump, can't see it excite, it eventually wants to come back home. And when it comes back home, it releases that energy and maybe when that happens, it produces some um, red photons. Turns out one electron falling produces one red photon. That will create a fingerprint unique to the atom and that's one of our labs coming up. Turns out if this electron were to jump way out here, to this way larger region, getting very excited now. We still can't see it, but maybe in this position, because it's so far away, the energy that it releases to get back home maybe now has more energy, so now it's gonna be, say, a blue photon. That's the idea of how electrons can be excited. You can't see the absorption of that energy but you can see it released. One electron that falls back to its ground state produces that photon of color, and that's how we see colors of light, just like we did in our flames for one of our earlier experiments. This is what told, told us the difference between classical physics and continuous physics. This ramp represents what we used to think about electrons in this classical kind of continuous motion. In this situation, we have a light bulb with a tungsten filament. Uniquely, tungsten is W, and cartoons use that W in their cartoon light bulbs, so uh, there's a shout out to that. 
But electrons go in and they also go out. Just like an electron that moves down a ramp, it produces red, orange, yellow, blue, indigo, and eventually violet. And we just assume that's what electrons always did. This new idea that we learn about in class is very different because now we have this idea that it's more like a staircase. Our electron sits here in its ground state and much like in this picture, it can jump to any one of these spots, but not in between. So because this is a quantity of energy, quantity of energy just means quantum physics. And that's our new version of how we understand light. It's all quantities of energy. We can't see the jump, but maybe if it's a little jump, it produces red. If it's a bigger jump, Maybe it produces blue, but this is how our atom works. We have different rows, so period one, period two, period three, period four, this is wrapping around our atom. So think about that as we move forward. And again, this is our nucleus way down here. These are our periods around the periodic table. Think about that as we get closer to understanding the periodic table and its ability to have electrons jump to higher levels but then release colored light, colored photons as they return. And we'll talk about that in another